Um, more chapter three today. And before we before we jump into jump back into section three six, I wanted to revisit this question, this extra problem that we looked at on uh, Monday. We were talking about tennis rackets and thinking about probability that um, if if the store has seven rackets of each version, and we want to know the probability that all of our next 10 customers get the racket they want, and we, we worked out what that was. And um, there was an excellent question, sort of uh, right right at the end there, that, that asks, how would this change if, how, how does the, the store's stock sort of affect, affect this question? Um, so sort of a slightly alternate question here is that suppose that they have seven of the one, of the one rackets, but only five of the other rackets. And then same question, what's the probability that um, that customers get the version they want from from the current stock, um, and I uh, um, had a good solution sent in, um, and wanted to kind of quickly review that, Ma mainly to point out. So, so because um, I was stumbling over my words here on Monday, it does in fact change the probability. Um, the uh, the number of smaller rackets that it has sort of affect how many how many customers can want the oversized racket. Um, but but the one thing I sort of wanted to point out was that uh, here in this binomial case, you can sort of choose whichever one you want as your success. So uh, we were talking about down here with the oversize, if we consider customers buying an oversized racket a success, um, then X is binomial with probability 0.6. Remember we said 60% of customers wanted an oversized racket. Um, so then customers can get at most seven because that's how many uh, oversized rackets there are. Um, but a minimum of five, because if fewer than five want oversized rackets, then they don't have enough mid-sized rackets. Um, so that changes slightly. You could also you could also think about it in terms of the mid-sized rackets. Um, if there's if there's only five mid-sized rackets, then at most five people can want the mid-size, and then at, at minimum three. And so that if you're considering the mid-sized racket a success, that would mean that 40% of people wanted a mid-sized racket. Um, and so you can see that those two probabilities are, are actually exactly the same. So kind of whichever way you can choose, you can choose either of either of the outcomes as your success. Um, sometimes it's more natural to consider one or the other, but you can consider either one you want. So I uh, just wanted to kind of put this up here and um, finish out that example. Any any questions or comments? Does that, does that make sense on what, what I'm talking about, the difference here? Yeah. Mm -hmm. problems. Um, the numbers that we find, those are the probabilities that you're finding on that table, right? So if you're right. looking at your values of like 0 0.01 and 0 0.05, mm -hmm. there's a bunch of ones down that mm -hmm. What are those representing? Like it's a really small percentage or chance. But yeah. So the question, the question is related to the table. Um, Well, this is a different table. I don't have that one pulled up on the slide here. But th so the question that you were saying was, uh, and here was a list of, you know, like zero, one, two, three, up to nine, and then your your probability, your p was kind of going across the top, so 0 0.1, whatever, 0 0.01, and in this first column you have a bunch of ones, right? Well, so um, so that number would have been, let me come back over here. That number would be so if let's see if x is Binomial um, ten with was it point point oh one or was it point yeah or point any of those really yeah so any of the really small ones so then so then you got a bunch of ones and so what that's telling you is that the probability that x is less than or equal to not uh, maybe I'm doing this backwards um, so the probability that x is less than or equal to nine, for example, is is essentially one. So it's just it's just a rounding off that eventually you get something that's that's almost almost one or almost zero on the other side, yeah. such that um, that's your that's an approximation to it. Um, so if you calculate out the exact probability, you would just find it's point nine 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 yeah. something. Or I guess I was thinking of like if it's larger than nine once you go into the value. So if you have uh, such a small chance of finding each individual one. Yeah. Uh, that's a good question. Uh, cal calculate out the probabilities. The, the combinations, um, so the, 
the problem p and one minus p, if they're if either one of those is really small or really big, then those numbers can get very close to one uh, or zero, as as the case may be. Is that okay? Okay. Um, any other any other questions regarding binomial stuff? Okay. Well, let's uh, let's jump back into chapter uh, section three point six. Um, and here again, we're talking about the, the Poisson distribution and uh, kind of what we looked at in section 3.4 with binomial. And yeah, here I'm at the bottom of page 13 on your chapter 3 notes. Um, in the binomial, so in the previous section, we were looking at situations in with, which our number of trials, for example, was fixed. So we had, you know, out of 10, 10 customers or out of 25 times you're playing this game or out of, so whatever. So what, we had a fixed number of observations or trials or experiments. And then we were counting the number of successes in that fixed number. Um, so there, you can imagine other cases where uh, the number of counts, the things you're looking at, is not, is not fixed. So there's not a fixed number of trials. You don't have a fixed number of things you're looking at. Um, so even in that case, you could still count the number of successes or sort of number of events or outcomes in some, some fixed measure of uh, some fixed unit measure, so like a fixed amount of time or a fixed amount of, of area, something like that. Um, and this is this is where the Poisson distribution comes in handy. So the, the two examples that I jotted down in your notes were uh, you could count, for example, the number of, of defects in um, in, the, in a car or something like that, or the number of customers that use a particular ATM between a certain range of time. Um, Sort of another another classic one is you could uh, you could count the number of red cars uh, that I don't know drive past drive past us on College Avenue here. So count the number of red cars that drive past on College Road between you know 8 a.m. and 10. AM or something like that. So you could, again, we have a fixed fixed window of time. We don't know how many cars are going to drive past, so we can't use some sort of binomial thing, but we can still count the number of red cars, for example, or whatever. Can anybody else think of any other examples that might fit into this framework? I haven't really motivated this yet, but... Yeah. The number of people who get, like, pepperoni pizza yeah, absolutely. So the number of people who get who order pepperoni pizza at a pizza joint from one to five or something like that. Absolutely. So you're looking at a certain amount of time. You don't know how many people are going to come into the pizza store, um, but you can still count how many people order a certain type of pizza. That's excellent. Yeah. Well, we'll look at a few other examples, but those are the type of settings that we're going to be um, that we can answer that answer probability questions about here in this section. Okay, so yeah, so this is called a Poisson random variable, and we looked at this briefly on one, uh, Monday and saw that, um, or we didn't, we didn't derive this or anything. You could, but this is uh, this is going to be the probability mass function for a Poisson random variable, and here our parameter now is is mu. So um, the PMF is going to be right there. So the e to the negative mu times mu to the x over x factorial for x equals 0, 1, 2, 3, and so on. So there's no sort of no upper bound on how many things we could count in this fixed um, range of time. So we're, it could be any, any positive integer there. Uh, that's our, our PMF, and our notation is going to be x is Poisson with parameter mu. And we'll look at, we'll talk more in just a minute about what that parameter means. So in, in the binomial setting, it was binomial NP, right? N was the number of trials, P was our success probability. It was sort of very natural interpretation of those parameters, and there is a natural one for this one as well, which I'll we'll get to in a little bit. So this is a this is the probability mass function. So if you want to know the probability of of counting a certain number of events in this certain amount of time, that's how you would calculate the probability of that. And we'll look at some examples. Um, but before we do that, uh, let's just double check to make sure that this thing is in fact a legitimate probability mass function. So I'm um, looking at that thing on the previous page. I want to make sure that's a legitimate P PMF. Um, so we have two things to check. 
Does anybody remember what those two things are for a probability mass function? Mm-hmm. Absolutely, yes. So the probabilities all add up to 1. And then sort of a trivial, the second thing which is sort of trivial is that, yeah. Each probability that like, is listed has a probability of having between 0 and 1. Right, so you can't have, probabilities all have to be between 0 and 1. So probabilities uh, between 0 and 1. And of course, we could have probability of zero or one, but nothing outside of that range. So let's make sure that we uh, let's make sure that we do in fact have this here. Um, so again, the PMF, the probability that x equals little x, is e to the negative mu times mu to the x over x factorial, and x can equal zero, one, two, and so on. So to sum up all the probabilities, we just need to sum that thing over, over x, right? So um, the sum of all x of the probability mass function, well, that's the sum from x equals 0 up to infinity of e to the negative mu times mu to the x over x factorial. And uh, maybe before I uh, before we take this one step further, does anybody remember from their calculus days the Taylor expansion of of e to the e to the y, for example? Does anybody remember that? Does that do you remember that that's something you did look at at some point? <laughs> um, well, the fact that we can use here is that uh, you can represent e to the y as um, I need another subscript. Um, so this, let's say, z equals 0 to infinity of, um, of y to the z over z factorial. So whatever's in that exponent, uh, you can raise that to the z power from z to infinity and divide by z factorial. That is a little fact from calculus. And lo and behold, that's exactly what we need. So we can rewrite this as... Um, we can bring the e to the negative mu outside the summation, and we have the same thing, x equals 0 to infinity of mu to the x uh, over x factorial. <coughs> but then using that little fact, we know that this, this thing right here is equal to e to the mu, so you can replace the, in the blue ink you can replace the y with mu and the z with x and that should give you the same thing there. So this is e to the negative mu times e to the mu which is indeed which is indeed 1. So the first thing checks out. So we do indeed have all of our probabilities add up to 1. That's, that's a good thing. And then secondly, we want to make sure our probabilities are all between 0 and 1. Uh, well, since they add up to 1, they all must be less than 1, right? Um, and then uh, I'll leave it to you to check that probably that x is equal to x is indeed greater than or equal to 0. Um, for all x equals 0, 1, 2. It's actually strictly greater than 0. You can even say that. So that one also, that one is a little, a little easier to check out, but uh, that, that is also true. So indeed, the Poisson PMF, uh, surprise, surprise, is a legitimate probability mass function. OK, so just a kind of reminder of what we need for a valid PMF. Is that okay with everybody? So we've talked about the PMF. We're not going to, um, well, I'll say something about the CDF in a minute here, but uh, let's first think about 
the expected value and variance of a um, Poisson random variable. So my proposition here is that the expected value and the variance actually both equal mu. So let's let's see about that. Um, so again, the expected value of x. Again, I just sum over all values of x times times its probability. Um, so here, this is going to be the sum again from x equals zero up to infinity of x times e to the negative mu times mu to the x over x factorial. And so now we can use some some uh, some fancy tricks here again. X factorial equals x times x minus one times and so on down down there. So um, we can actually cancel the x out here and make this an x minus one factorial. So x divided by x factorial is one over x minus one factorial. And you can bring uh, you can again pull the uh, the e to the negative mu outside the summation there. And we're also going to pull one of those, so I have, I have x copies of mu multiplied together there. Right? I have uh, um, mu to the x, I have, so I have x copies. So I'm also going to pull one of those outside the summation. Um, and we can write this as follows. So I can pull e to the negative mu outside. I can pull one, one copy of mu out. And then I have a summation from x equals 0 to infinity. Uh, or sorry, I actually have x equals one now in infinity times uh, u to the x minus one um, divided by x minus one factorial. So when x equals zero, sorry, that that whole thing is is equal to zero. So I can kind of ignore that case, um, and so summing from something zero plus something else, you can just ignore the first term and I can go from one to infinity instead of from zero to infinity. Okay, and then to use to use uh, kind of kind of like we did before, I'm gonna throw a little substitution at you here. Um, and I'm gonna say I'm gonna let y equal x minus one so that I can rewrite this thing as uh, the sum uh, e to the negative mu times mu to, from the summation of y equals zero to infinity of mu to the y over y factorial. So if I go from one to infinity, if x equals one to infinity, then y goes from zero to infinity still. And now that's looking like something we saw just on the previous slide. Um, so this is equal to e to the negative mu times mu times e to the mu and those exponential terms cancel and you have just a just a mu hanging around there. Yeah. Yeah, good question. So so um the thing that I didn't write write in here maybe should have been that um, this is actually equal to, so summing from x equals 0 to infinity, um, if, I, if I write out what the 0 term is, it's going to be equal to 0. So this is equal to um, 0 times e to the negative mu times mu to the 0 over 0 factorial plus the sum from x equals 1. So, um, so this this first term equals zero, it's multiplying times zero, and then the second term, uh, I have everything the same. I'm just kind of rewriting it. Um, so I'm pulling the e to the negative mu outside. I'm canceling the x with the x in the numerator with the x in the denominator, um, and I'm pulling a one copy of mu out aside as well. So the subscript should stay from one to infinity and should be x minus one in the denominator. Yeah. Sorry, I, I should have written that out the first time through. Okay, so again, this is this is maybe some complicated calculations. You're not going to be asked to do anything. This been kind of walking through these derivations with you. Um, 
So that's that's the the mean or the expected value of my Poisson random variable. Um, you could do a similar thing to show that the expected value of x squared. Uh, I'm not going to write all this out. Is is mu squared plus plus mu. So we do the exact same thing, just summing up over uh, x equals zero to infinity times <clears throat> um, x squared times that the PMF for each value of x. And if you if you want to try that, you can check and see that you will indeed get mu squared plus mu. Um, so then the the variance of x. Again, remember our shortcut there is the expected value of x squared um, minus the expected value of x quantity squared. <clears throat> and that will again give us a, a mu. So the Poisson is a sort of a random, uh, an unusual situation where its random variable has mean and variance that are the same thing. That's kind of unusual. So now, so now seeing that the expected value of our random variable is mu, that gives us a nice interpretation for, for what mu is. So we can now think of that as being the, the average number or the or the mean number of successes um, per unit of time. So if I'm talking about you know, one sheet metal, uh, one one sheet of sheet metal, or if I'm talking about a, a two-hour time window, I can expect mu number of successes per that unit of measure. So that's the way that you can interpret this parameter here in this in this case. Everybody with me? Is that is that okay? Okay. Well, enough, uh, enough looking at details. Let's actually do an example and see if we can apply this thing here. So first example here is that, uh, looking at carpet manufacturing. And this person knows that the number of flaws per square yard in a type of carpet um, varies with an average of two flaws per square yard. So we don't know how many flaws are going to show up in this, in this square yard of carpet, but we, uh, on average, know that there are two flaws per square yard. And so then let's let x equal the number of flaws. Let's count up the number of flaws in a particular square yard and uh, kind of think about that can be modeled in terms of a Poisson distribution here. So if we let um, x equal the number of flaws per unit of measure, and here unit of measure is a square yard of carpet, then we could also write x is distributed as Poisson with um, mu equal to 2. So with average number of flaws per square yard equal to 2. So again, um, I'm telling you that it's Poisson, but you can think about why that is. So again, we have a fixed unit of measure. We have, we're talking about square yards of carpet. And uh, we, don't know, we don't know our total number of I mean, you don't know the total. There's, there's not, no total number to count, so you can only count um, flaws, and we don't know how many there could be. There could be zero, one, two, three, and so on. So there's no fixed number of trials like we saw in a, in a binomial <laughs> experiment. Okay, some questions. So we'll, this is this is the table. We'll, we'll we'll use this in the second part of our uh, this example, um, but just like just like for the binomial distribution. Um, when you're dealing with the CDF, there's no closed form for that. Um, so you can either calculate the individual probabilities and add them up, or you can use a table like this, or you can use your calculator. Again, there's some um, it's very, very close to the same place you were in your calculator for the binomial uh, CDF and otherwise. Um, so over here, over here, we have our the number of so x equals zero, one, two, three over here, and then um, it lists. Pr uh, probabilities for a variety of of mu values there. So whatever your average number of things per per unit, you can calculate probabilities this way. So we'll, we'll, we'll practice using that in just a second here um, in part B. But in part A, <clears throat> so what is the probability of obser observing exactly three flaws in a randomly chosen square yard of this material? So what's the probability of seeing three flaws? Well, this is just the, again, the probability that x equals 3 
which again is just calculating our PMF for x equals 3. Um, so this is e to the negative mu times uh, mu to the x over x factorial. Here x is 3, mu is 2, so this is e to the negative 2 times uh, 2 to the third over 3 factorial. And that should be 0 0.1804. So the chance that we would see three flaws in this in this carpet is 0.1804. Okay, similarly we could uh, ask a question like we've seen before too. What's the probability of there being no more than four flaws in a in a square yard of this material? So I want the probability of x and then something about four. What uh, what? If I want no more than four, what, what should be my inequality symbol there? Less than or equal to, very good. So I want there to be less than or equal to four flaws, or no more than four flaws. Um, and so, again, as usual, we could add up probabilities here. This We could add up probability that x equals zero, plus probability that x equals one, and so on, up to the probability that x equals four. Those are all the cases that would fall under that. Um, or we could use the CDF. Um, so if you want to do five calculations there, go for it. Uh, we're gonna, I'm going to take a shortcut. And let's jump back to the table here. <clears throat> so here our, our mu, we're told, is 2. So we can look at this column here. And then if we want the probability that x is less than or equal to 4, there it is, 0.947. Zero point nine four seven. That's from table A dot two. So if you calculate each of those five probabilities and add them up, you should get point nine four seven. Okay, so pretty pretty straightforward example, I guess, but uh, just kind of showing you how we can start to use use the formulas here. Questions or comments? Yeah. If we can use our calculator for the binomial and Poisson, we need to use the tables. Mm. Great question. So if you have the calculator and you know how to use it to calculate these probabilities, do you have to use the table? No, definitely not. So if you can use your calculator and get the right answer, that's that's great. <clears throat> yeah, the, t the tables are sort of like, I, I feel like it's sort of an archaic way of uh, finding these probabilities. Maybe you guys think that too. Um, <coughs> I think if you were in the real world, you would go to a calculator. Or there's, there's also, you could probably find little ways to calculate these things on like a little web applet too, if you, if you want to do it that way for your homework. Um, so yeah, so if you, however you know how to do it is fine. Of course, on the ex if if it's on an exam, um, you can only use a calculator, and there's no, uh, no, no other. I mean, I'll give you the tables, but um, no other way to do that on the exam. So, but yeah, calculator is is great. <clears throat> All right. So a slight, a slight extension that we can use this Poisson distribution for is, is a, the first approximation that we'll see in this class. Um, and so let's let's go back to the binomial case very quickly here and um, think about what happens if the number of trials in our binomial experience sort of goes off to infinity. So as the number of trials that we have for a binomial random variable gets larger and larger. Um, so what, what happens to that, to that um, probability mass function? So if we let, uh, so our situation, we let x equal the number of wins, for example, if we're looking at a uh, number of trials that involve winning and losing. Uh, we have n of them, and we have p, which is a probability of winning, which is some, some, small, some small value of p. Then the exact distribution, of course, is binomial with n trials and success probability p. And x can equal 0, 1, 2, 3, all the way up to n. Um, but once n gets to be a little bit larger, so 50, 60, 100, 200, 300, um, calculating those probabilities can be, can be kind of cumbersome. So specifically, uh, if you're doing it by hand anyway, calculating the combinatorial term is going to be a, a problem because you have some really large factorial terms in there. Um, 
so so there's a there's a different way we can approach this. Uh, there's a way we can sort of take a shortcut to, to calculate this. And this is as follows. So if if you have a, so the, sort of the formal result, sort of the mathematical result here, which we're not going to look at too much. Um, if you want to try it out, it just involves doing some limits uh, of series and all that good stuff. Um, we see that the binomial PMF uh, actually approaches the Poisson PMF if, um, if n goes to infinity and p goes to zero in such a way that um, np approaches some value mu. So as long as n times p doesn't also equal zero or infinity, um, then this formal result will hold. Which is just a fancy way of saying that the Poisson distribution can be used to approximate the binomial distribution when, um, when n is large and p is small. So when you have really large n and really small p, um, then we can use this approximation and specifically let mu equal n times p. So what do I mean n large and p small? So sort of a uh, safe way, the one we know we can safely apply this thing is if, um, uh, if n is bigger than 50 and p, sorry, and n times p, is less than 5. So there I say uh, it's, this is a good approximation when n is large and p is small. Um, sort of your practical takeaway from there is as long as n is at least 50 and n times p is less than 5, then we're, we're okay to use this approximation. Those numbers are somewhat arbitrary, but it's good to have sort of a cutoff to say when uh, yes or no, it's things should be pretty close or, or no, it won't be that close. Okay, it's sort of, sort of a visual proof I'll give you here uh, is top of the year notes on page 16. Uh, and we don't often look at, this is good, we don't often look at our PMF sort of in, in graph form like this, but it's good, good practice to think about it that way. Um, so for n equals to 30, so here, here even uh, n is not even as big as we're sort of needing it to be. Um, the, the circle at the top of each bar represents the, the binomial probability, and then the little, the little um, x represents the, or sorry, the, the solid dash represents the Poisson probability. So it's just showing you that, that these things are, are pretty close for, uh, for values of n that are even, even 30. Um, 100 is even closer, and if we showed you more, it would be even closer than that. So it's just a visual proof. It's proof by, by looking um, that, this, that this is true, and this is a good, good way to do it. Um, so, so anyway, that's, this is uh, how we can use this approximation. So let's, let's actually look at doing this. Um, so we're, uh, we have any musicians in the crowd. We have, uh, think about a certain institute of music in Philadelphia. It has the lowest nationwide acceptance rate of 3.2%. So that's very low. Um, so let's suppose we take a random sample of 100 applicants and let x equal the number that are accepted. And then the question that we might ask is what's the probability that at least five of the students, at least five of the students are accepted. So if you if you looked at this problem before we started talking about this approximation thing, you, you could have could have written down that um, x has a binomial distribution. with um, n equal to 100 and p equal to 0 0.032. This is the exact distribution. That's the exact distribution of the number of applicants that are accepted out of that 100. Um, but because, <clears throat> because uh, our conditions check out, we can use this approximation. So because, because n equals 100 is indeed greater than 50, and n times p is uh, 3.2 is also is less than 5,
So because our sample size is big enough and because our success probability is small enough there that um, n times p is less than 5, uh, we can approximate that binomial distribution by writing that x is approximately distributed. So I'm going to put that little dot over my distributed sign. It's approximately distributed as a Poisson with mu equal to 3.2. So this symbol here means approximately distributed as. And that will allow me to make this calculation a little more, a little more easily. Um, so the probability, the probability that I want, I want the probability that uh, the number of applicants, so the number of applicants that are accepted is at least five. So how would I write that in probability notation? Probably that x is, is what? Thank you, yes, so greater than or equal to five. And uh, again, this is a sequel to one minus the probability that x is less than or equal to four. And then if we, uh, if we approximate it using this Poisson distri distribution approximation, um, this is approximately equal to um, 1 minus 0 0.7806. And the 0 0.7086, I'm just adding up the five Poisson probabilities, x equals 0, 1, 2, 3, and 4, when mu is equal to 3.2. So kind of jumping over that step. Um, so this is approximately equal to um, 0.2194. Again, this is using the Poisson. Yeah? What, if any, is the reason for using the Poisson approximation rather than the exact distribution in this circumstance other than the other than <laughs> So why would, we, why would we actually need to do this other than it's a good way to illustrate the point. Uh, yeah, you could you could calculate this exactly, um, and I, I was I was going to jot down here that the the exact probability uh, is actually if you did this using the binomial, this is actually 0.217. So it's it's pretty close there, up to 0 0.002. Again, yeah. So so in this example, you could have done it either way, and I mean, n equal to 100 is not that big, um, but if you had n equal to a thousand or something even bigger than that then it just kind of becomes complicated to, or tricky to calculate those things and it's a little easier to use the approximation. So you're welcome to do it either way, of course. Um, that'll just, it's a little bit of a shortcut here. Okay, so that's our, that's our approximation. So you just, to use this, you just wanna make sure that your sample size is big enough and n times p is small enough. Um, and you can do it, you can do it that way. So one more thing to note about the Poisson distribution here is this, uh, this thing called the Poisson process. Uh, so um, we can use, well, again, we've seen that we can use the Poisson to model sort of the occurrence of events or counting events over some interval of time. So there's a few more examples there you have. Um, and that's kind of what we looked at so far. But what happens if we assume that the probability of, of one thing happening is approximately proportional to the length of the time interval or proportional to the, um, you know, per square yard or per unit of measurement. Um, that's going to give us this idea of um, the Poisson process. Um, so the probability that, so, so this, before I explain it to you, this looks sort of familiar. It looks sort of like the Poisson PMF that we saw before. Um, but if we let this capital P sub K of T represent the probability that, that K events happen during um, an observed time interval of length T, so T could be any, any uh, positive number here, um, then if certain assumptions are met, then the prob that probability is equal to something that looks very much like a Poisson um, PMF there. Um, and so the assumptions that I'm talking about means that uh, are kind of what was said just on that previous page, kind of like the binomial assumptions where you have independent events, like the events happening are independent of each other, 
and you have sort of a constant probability of those events occurring per, per unit of time. Um, then this is a way that you can calculate that. Um, And this this number of this number of occurrences is called the the Poisson process. So it's slight slight difference from um, the Poisson random variable that we saw before, because the Poisson process we can look at any any length of any length of time as opposed to a fixed fixed unit of time. And uh, so again, the the notation that we're changing from here is also we're going from mu to alpha. So alpha times the length of time. Um, and so, so again, we know we know the expected value of a Poisson random variable is is mu. So if mu equals alpha times t, we would expect alpha times t um, events during a interval of length t. So that alpha is is kind of like your um, expected number of events during a unit time interval. And so here, alpha is talking about the sort of the rate of occurrences, whereas uh, mu was the mean number of occurrences per fixed fixed measure of time. And uh, so I, I kind of wrote this down again just to make this a little bit more of a distinction here. Um, so the first thing we talked about in, chap in this section was Poisson random variable. And I don't have this in your notes. Um, so for the, the first thing we looked at was we had a fixed, a fixed unit of measure. So that was a certain area of carpet or a certain length of time or, or whatever we had there. Um, and an average rate per that fixed unit of measure. So for each square yard of carpet, we had a certain number of um, of uh, mistakes in the carpet. So that, that was the Poisson random variable. The slight the slight thing we're changing to down here in the Poisson process is that we're given an average rate per single unit of measure. So uh, we'll look at an example of this. Hopefully, we'll clear that up a little bit. Um, so if we know how many we can expect per unit of measure, unit of time, for example. Then we can calculate probabilities for any any number of any number of units of measure. So, so of time t, we can calculate how many events occur in any any window of time t. So slight slight difference here between the Poisson random variable and the Poisson process. It's very much the same thing, but just uh, depending on the information that's given you, you want to use one or the other. Okay, so let's look at an example of this. Going back to something that is in your notes. So we can think about the number of requests for assistance received by a towing service here. And um, we're going to be told that that is a Poisson process with rate alpha equals 4 per hour. So uh, what we're told here, maybe we know this from sort of historical data from this company, that the average number of requests they get per hour is 4. So they're, they on average receive 4 phone calls or whatever per hour to um, come get some towing help. So let's compute the probability that exactly 10 requests are received during a particular two hour period. Okay, so again, because, uh, so for a two hour period, um, the parameter that we want, the parameter, the mean number of a request per those two hours is going to be um, mu, or you could also take that alpha times t, which is four times four uh, four per hour times two hours, which is eight. So think about the number that you would expect to happen during that two-hour time time interval is 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 eight. You'd expect the company would expect to get eight phone calls then. So what's the chance that we get exactly ten? Well, this is just the probability that um, Poisson random variable is equal to 10, uh, where x is distributed as Poisson with parameter 8. And so this is just e to the negative 8 times uh, 8 to the 10th power divided by 10 factorial. And if you calculate that out, you should get 0 0.0993. 
Okay, so that's how many, uh, that's the problem of getting 10 within two hours. Um, similar question here is, uh, so suppose whoever is operating this towing service takes a 30 minute lunch break, um, then what is the probability that they, that they do not miss any calls? So it's probably that, they, that zero phone calls come in in this 30, 30 minute time interval. Uh, well, so the same setup, so 30 minutes is half an hour, right? So the, um, the parameter here, uh, the expected number of calls is equal to the number of calls per hour, alpha times one half an hour. So this is four times half an hour. So the parameter is, is two. So again, kind of being very formal here, if, if x equals the number of calls in 30 minutes, um, x is distributed as Poisson, parameter 2. And then what's uh, what's what probability am I am I looking at here? So what's the probability that they do not miss any calls? That's probably that x equals what? X equals zero. So I want if they for them to not miss any calls, that means that zero phone calls have to come in in this time, uh, which is just e to the negative two times um, two to the zero over zero factorial, which is point one three five three. So the difference here with the Poisson process is just given given one uh, one number, so we know how many calls come in per hour. We can answer questions about differing lengths of time by doing this little calculation here of alpha times t. It's kind of the, the difference that we're looking at here. Okay, and finally, how many calls would you expect? So how many calls would you expect them to receive during their lunch break? Um, again, expected calls is just let's see. Expected value of x is mu, which again here is alpha times t, which is uh, 4 times 1 half or 2. So we would expect there to be two calls come in during their, during their lunch break. Questions, comments you guys can think of on the, these Poisson questions? Okay. Well, hey, we made it through uh, chapter three. That's great. I'm actually going to go ahead and stop lecturing for the day and take a few minutes to hand back your homework. So um, you guys can come on down to the front and I'll start handing back homework. Thanks for being here today.